Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Tuesday, June 6th, 2023. <clears throat> it's about 1030 in the morning here on the East Coast uh, of the United States. Alistair Crook uh, joins us from Italy. Alistair, it's a pleasure. Thank you uh, for all your time on the show. You, you recently write that the initial burst of European excitement at Western pushback against Russia has dissipated and turned into an existential dread. How can European public opinion move 180 degrees in 18 months? Because it wasn't public opinion. It was elite opinion. The European elites, many of whom have been invested in, you know, Brzezinski's, Zivig Brzezinski's plan to destroy um, Russia and the heartland, and Ukraine being the spear tip of this proposal. Many of them, like Germany, like um, Merkel, um, parts of Europe had been invested in this heavily with the uh, uh, team Biden. And so they were absolutely cock a hoop because it seemed for a moment Europe was going to actually be on the world stage. The European Union was going to unseat a major government by its financial war alone and collapse it quickly. Of course, it never happened. It was actually the converse happened. And it's Europe that has ended up weaker. But at that early moment, it was full. You know, Europe was standing six feet tall. They were suddenly, finally, as they'd always hoped to be, a big player on the world stage, joining top table with Washington, deciding about the future um, of the world. Wasn't to be. Now, what is the basis for the European animosity toward Russia? Is it a carryover from fear of the old Soviet Union? Is it a failure to recognize the, the commercial value of, of Russia today as a trading partner, uh, as opposed to the thuggery of the Soviet Union days? You know, there's, there's such a long history to this. I mean, you can go back a thousand years to the original schism uh, of the, you know, when the Orthodox Church was thrown out of the um, of Christianity into its own Christianity. Uh, it's been a long process, and don't forget we've had big wars against Russia. Germany has fought two bloody wars against Russia. And, uh, and I think the exact animosity become is really because, you know, Europe felt it was so close to bringing down Russia and forcing it into the Western sphere during those Yeltsin period, right. where the you know neoliberalizing everything, privatizing everything, it almost crashed. And then Putin came and saved the day. And not only saved the day, turned the whole thing around about. They can never, I mean, I think Obama and Clinton could never forgive him for that. Never. And, and yet the Europeans have made themselves so dependent on NATO and so dependent on the United States. Could, could, could the EU hold its own militarily? No, not at all. I, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, at the moment, they could perhaps position 30,000 troops at the most from all of Europe. I mean, all NATO states. Um, they have no weapons, no artillery shells. They're completely bereft of equipment. They couldn't hold their own in it. But what the story of NATO is a complicated one, but essentially it became to be seen amongst the liberal elite, not the ordinary people, but amongst the liberal elite, it seemed to be become particularly at the time of the Yugoslav war, the breakup of Yugoslavia, the Kosovo incident, it seemed to be an instrument for correcting wrongs and injustices. It was, NATO was going to bomb and take over a country um, because there had been a massacre in Kosovo. And this animated, and then NATO suddenly became a sort of a, an instrument of expressing virtuosity, not a, a military alliance. It was a sort of moral crusading force for good in the world as it was seen by the elites. 
uh, the, the public as a whole have been much more skeptical and much more cautious about this. What, 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 is, the, what is the pulse of the public in Europe today? Does it, does it lead the elites or does it follow them? Uh, it looks as if there's going to be a big bust up uh, uh, on this. There's a really seminal crack taking place. It's most obvious in Germany, uh, where a, a recent poll has shown um, that uh, Scholz's uh, uh, um, party has very little support, that one in five Germans supports the right party, uh, Alternative für Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany party, uh, which is opposed to NATO and opposed to the war in, in, in Ukraine. One in five. And the Greens have slumped to 13%. It's All right, let, let me make sure I have this correct. The, the right-wing party, is this neo-Nazi? No, no. I mean, it's, it, 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 at one stage, there were some neo-Nazis that came into it. But it was founded by two I, I, I German economists originally who were opposed to um, Germany joining the euro and joining going into the European Union. Um, so it was very mainstream, and there were some um, uh, far right that came into it um, shortly after, but then they were removed, and it's become very popular because of partly because of immigration, and Germans were shocked, nearly fell off their seats when they uh, when they picked up the Zeit um, a few days ago, and the Zeit uh, reflected the poll that um, the majority in Germany are not Germans any longer. Migrants are now the majority of the people of Germany. And Germans were, I mean, really astonished at this. And it's changing politics, that, 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 that in itself, plus inflation, plus the cost of living, plus the deindustrialization of Germany is pushing everything to the right, not just in Germany, but in Brussels with the EPP party, which is the sort of Brussels coalition of centre-right. All of these are moving, and the movement against the Greens is growing um, everywhere because their policies are seen to be just uh, not viable. I mean, it's just ridiculous in these circumstances when people are trying to survive and not buy heat pumps for their house or change their heating of the house from gas, which works perfectly well to sort of uh, renewable fuels. People are up in arms against this. Have the Greens become pro-war? That's almost unthinkable. The, they, they, originally, they were completely the opposite. They were traditional left-wing peace party. Right. And then it started to change, and Kosovo marked the change. Um, it started to change before that, but in Kosovo, the party broke. And some of the Greens, and people like Annalena Baerbach, is the, the foreign minister of Germany, is the sort of lineal successor to that. They became pro-NATO, pro-war. They saw war, and there was an EU sort of ideologue who I knew quite well, Robert Cooper, who wrote about this new um, soft power empire that would be, be Europe, and that it was fine to disregard international law. It was fine to put in protectorates into states that were not conforming to the values of Europe. I mean, literally, um, you know, regime changed them. Um, but there was no army. There was only America. And so Here, this it, meant that they had to get much closer to America because here's Europe what has you, no army. Here's what you wrote yesterday, <clears throat> quoting someone named Lily Lynch, a Belgrade-based writer. No political party in Europe better exemplifies the shift from militant pacifism to ardent pro-war Atlanticism than the German Greens. Yep. That's right. Correct. What, what, what percentage of the uh, popu uh, population do they represent? Well, they've had a big following um, during um, this uh, recent period. As I say, if you go back to the start of the Ukraine um, conflict, they were, very, they were in government and were probably the most influential party in Germany and in Brussels. 
and now it's just gone down like a rock. And now it's only 13% in, in Germany and elsewhere it's falling and there's protests everywhere. But there are other states too. I mean, besides uh, France, but Austria and Slovakia, which are becoming much more pro-Russian. So there's a big shift taking place in, in, in European politics. I mean, in a sense, sort of reflecting a little bit, but with a lag of what has happened in the United States in the sort of the fault line is between, if you like, the globalist um, parties that favor uh, a, a green agenda, a militant radical green agenda, and traditionalists who believe in traditional values. So where does all this fit in with pres French President Macron, who was excoriated, as you know, for warning that Europeans will end up becoming American vassal states? And we said this after he was excoriated for saying we can't accept the American rhythm of constant war. Is he an outcast in Europe? Uh, Semi-outcast, yes. But Europe, I mean, the, the, what you've just described reflects the other great fracture. Europe, the Ukraine war has fractured Europe into the East European, what I think it was uh, uh, one American leader called New Europe, versus old Europe. And it came about because old Europe was against the Iraq war. And the East Europeans were in favor and are in favor of weakening Russia completely. And so there's been a tight alliance between the East European, Central and East European states and Washington against old Europe, France, Germany, Italy, etc. But at the end of this, it will be the Western states that will pay the price for Ukraine. Deindustrialization in Germany and France and Italy, economic uh, unemployment, social um, tensions. That is what will be coming. Uh, let me show you the most recent development uh, in the war, which is the destruction of this dam. This is, this So you, there are the explosion, there's secondary and uh, tertiary uh, explosions. The American media is portraying this as having been perpetrated by the Kyiv regime itself, even though it is Ukraine that is being flooded by this. In a couple of minutes or moments, you'll see the massive movement of water. There it is, massive movement of water. Uh, flooding Ukrainian towns, uh, villages, and the city uh, of Kherson. I guess this means, Alastair, this is the beginning of the uh, of the spring offensive. The the use of uh, natural forces to destroy parts of Ukraine, albeit parts held by the Russians. Look, we don't know how it happened. I'm not sufficiently sort of, of a military person to judge those explosions, what sort of um, explosive or missile was used. I almost wonder if it was not intended by either side. Because if you recall early on, the Russians uh, withdrew from the Kherson province precisely out of fear that that dam could be destroyed and that the area and their troops all flooded, and that would cut off part of their forces on the other side of the river who would be isolated and could be surrounded and killed. So they got out of Kherson precisely because of the fear of, of, of that dam. Now, since then, although Russia does control the area around the, the dam, um, periodically um, the Ukrainians have been firing missiles at it. I mean, throughout this period, they've been firing MR, MRLS, rockets. Not very effective. They haven't damaged it. But this time they took out the sluice gates, not the foundations. They seem to be intact, but they took out the sluice gates. Did they intend to do that? You know, well, who benefits? It's not clear. Um, the Ukrainians don't greatly benefit because it thought they were thinking of crossing the river, the Dnieper River, and that they would then come up by Kherson and attack 
that way. Now it's impossible. Um, the, the Russians have their defensive lines. Some of their defensive lines may be flooded by this. It's not clear yet. So it's, you know, there isn't a very easy answer to say who, qui bono in this case. Right, right, right. Well, how do you see this ending? I mean, does it end now? Conflict. Or, or do, does it end 100,000 deaths and $100 billion from now? Well, I, uh, two things is I don't think we're in the grand offensive yet. I'll tell you why. I mean, there are, are military operations taking place, and they've been all pushed back by the Russians. And they are all in Donbass. They've been in Donbass in this period, uh, and there have been heavy casualties inflicted on, 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 on the Ukrainians. But the original um, brigades that had training in Europe, in Britain, and Germany, and elsewhere, as far as I can see, have not been deployed yet and seemingly are being kept, or maybe they just don't want to use them. So the, these forces they've been using are probably put together of conscripts and odds and ends from other forces, and therefore are not their best forces. Is it a probing? Is it looking for a weakness on the Russian side and then they can push through? I'm, you know, I don't know. If we actually see all those forces deployed, then maybe we are in it, but this, I don't know that they even have the ability to, to do a big, uh, a big offensive at this moment. Where it's all going is, is quite interesting. Medvedev, who is the former president and is the number two on their National Security Council, has been talking that there are, I mean, there are basically two options. Re really, the slow, if you like, degradation of what they call the territory that used to be known as Ukraine. I mean, that's the terms they're using now. The slow um, attrition of it or the rapid attrition. And what will follow from that? And he says, well, there may be that the Western lands will be taken by receiving European states, like Poland and Hungary and others. And, and there will be a, if you like, no-go zone between the two, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 or else it may go and there won't be a rump European state at all, or a European state that might uh, still want to go into Europe and NATO, in which case he says then there'll be war probably. I mean, at one point he said that the Russian troops would march all the way to the Polish border. Uh, he doesn't rule that out. He doesn't rule that out. But I mean, his main point is, I mean, so much... I mean, this is his point, not mine, but his right, point right, right. is, I mean, it so much depends on whether it's a slow collapse or a quick collapse, but he regards the collapse as inevitable. I and then you're... what the Europeans are going to do with that and whether there will be an escalation from uh, uh, NATO that follows that. I know your field is uh, diplomacy, politics, culture, but do you think there's a feeling in Europe that the Ukrainian military has defied expectations, that everybody thought the Russians would be farther west by now? I, I think the West has completely, although I'm not a military person, I've been in conflict for 35 years now, one way or another, uh, I mean, in, in the middle of it or mediating in it. Um, I think the West has completely misread um, the whole of Russian intentions. The Russians never intended to go straight up to Kiev at the beginning. They followed the pattern of Syria, which was economy of forces, just enough of a show to try and, if you like, catalyze a peace process, which happened. It was Turkey. It was the Astana Agreement they did. They tried the same thing again, sort of saying, look, we're serious. This is a, you know, we all, there's a whole column marching down towards uh, Kiev. It was 40,000 men. I mean, that'll just about fill the, the Piazza del Popolo in Rome. It's not going to take a city of 3.2 million. Um, but it was a mistake. It was wrong. It didn't work. And then Russia has re, um, if you like, orientated put in more forces, I don't think they w want to go because 
Medeva made a hint of this, and this was it. He said, what we really don't want is because the West are rabidly anti-Russian. I mean, remnants of Hitler groups um, from the war and others, and rabidly and strong. He doesn't want an insurgency to sort of have a, a base so close to whatever is the sort of final line between Ukraine and um, the West. La last uh, topic, and we talk about this frequently, uh, President Biden, he still has no, no exit ramp whatsoever. He's being challenged by uh, the nephew of Robert Kennedy, who keeps growing in the polls amongst uh, Democrats and who sounds more like uh, Ron Paul uh, than, than he does a mainstream uh, Democrat. But I don't want to get into American domestic politics. I just want to underscore the pressures on, on Joe Biden. What does he do? He keeps shoveling billions uh, into this and he doesn't get any return politically or militarily. It's, it's strange because uh, you probably saw Blinken, I think he was at Bratislava or somewhere, he said, look, no ceasefire. No, it's not going to work. We're not looking for a ceasefire. We're not aiming for a ceasefire. What we're focused on now is either the offensive working or else we are going to a long-term build-up of the military forces in, in Ukraine, rebuilding them, re-equipping them, Aye. giving the latest weapons. But I, 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 you know better than I, but like, I mean, you know, I know Kennedy and his, and, and his supporters, many of them feel, you know, all this money should be spent on the problems here in America. Yes, of course. Not in this. And so, the dynamic, I think, is becoming quite tense about this in the United States, exactly as it is in Europe, because we're already deeply into that sort of sense of deindustrialization that is taking place. Gary, can you, uh, can you get your hands on uh, Secretary Blinken? And, uh... As I've made clear, by virtually every measure, President Putin's invasion of Ukraine has been a strategic failure. Yet, while Putin has failed to achieve his aims, he hasn't given up on them. He's convinced that he can simply outlast Ukraine and its supporters, sending more and more Russians to their deaths, inflicting more and more suffering on Ukraine's civilians. He thinks that even if he loses the short game, he can still win the long game. Putin is wrong about this, too. The United States, together with our allies and partners, is firmly committed to supporting Ukraine's defense today, tomorrow, for as long as it takes. This can't be the opinion of the American uh, public. This is, this is just the Lindsey Graham amongst Republicans and the globalists amongst uh, Democrats. They have no, I keep saying this, they have no exit ramp, Alistair. They, they're, they entered a tunnel when, you know, they should have paused at the mouth of the tunnel and decided to take another uh, way out. They're too late now. They're in a tunnel, and I don't think they see any way of going back or well, sideways. They just have to go through to the light at the end if there is any light at the end. What is the uh, British involvement uh, in the war uh, in Ukraine? And if there is any, is it directed by the U.S.? Well, I, yes, it's very close. I mean, all this talk about, you know, the United States are not involved in what's happening in Belograd and things like that. I mean, you know, this is what we call deniability. There are two things that are very important to understand. First of all, Britain never, ever will comment on special, its special forces, the SAS or the SBS. And at the same time, America will never comment on intelligence allies. And so that gives uh, complete deniability to the U.S. And they say, no, we, you know, we're not involved. We don't know anything about it. It must be the Brits doing it. But of course, I do know those people quite well. And <laughs> they are like that with their American colleagues, with Delta and the SAS. I mean, they're in each other's pockets and... Uh, you know, going to each other's weddings. 
of course, everyone knows what's going on. Alistair, always a pleasure. No matter how gloomy this is, your, your uh, ideas always enlighten our understanding. Thank you very much for joining us, as always. Thank you. My pleasure. Of course. More as we get it. Uh, Colonel McGregor, uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon, Eastern. Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom. <laughs>